25 years ago, I sold my soul to the devil to become a corporate executive. I quit it all to play the blues. My name is Tom the Suit Forest, and this is Chasing the Blues. Hey everybody, this is Tom the Suit Forest, and this is another session of Chasing the Blues Podcast.com. Today I am very pleased to have as our guest Anthony Gracchi. Hey Anthony, how are you? I'm doing fine. Nice to be speaking with you. Yeah, I'm, I'm very excited to have you. You are uh, an excellent player. Uh, you've got some great albums which I've uh, I've listened to, and you're uh, a New England guy, or you at least you're New England guy. I live just uh, south of uh, Boston, Massachusetts. Ah, okay. Well, I <clears throat> I live in Connecticut, so we are not. Uh, we yeah, probably. I grew up in Connecticut. I was born in Connecticut. Oh, where? <laughs> Uh, just in New Haven, Connecticut. Oh, yeah, that's right. I, I actually do remember that. That's right. You start. I rem, uh, now I do remember that. Yeah, I, I um I actually grew up in Coventry, which uh, I'm not sure you would know where that is. Most people don't, but it's a uh, kind of a lower class area in uh, the country in uh, eastern Connecticut. So, uh-huh. so Anthony, um, <clears throat> I wanted to ask you because I saw that you uh, also did uh, graduate from Berkeley. I did. I graduated from Berkeley. Uh, it took me about 20-something years because I <laughs> left Berkeley around 1978 to uh, join uh, um, the original, what became Sugar Ray and the Blue Tones, with Ronnie Earl. Um, right. Ronnie, I, I had been opening up for Muddy Waters for a whole week at the Jazz Workshop, uh, Paul's Mall in Boston, and uh, Ronnie and Mudcat came and hear me, and they were thinking about starting a blues band. So I, uh, uh, they came to, over to my house one day, and it was really funny. I was, like, writing a sonata, and uh, Ronnie said, I want you to be in my band. And then and just off the cuff, I said, yeah, okay. And I, I literally quit school the next day. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and went on the road with uh, Ronnie Earl, and that was, like, the original uh, Sugar Ray and the Blue Tones. It was Mudcat Ward, Ronnie Earl, of course, um, Sugar Ray Norris, had Neil Gouvin, and uh, myself. And then Ron- Ronnie went on to uh, um, play with Roomful of Blues for a while. I think he was, like, missing that, like, you know, real five-piece Chicago kind of style. And that's when um, the broadcasters um, came into being. I mean, he was still a member of Roomful of Blues, but he started putting out um, solo records under um, Ronnie Earl and the broadcasters. And I was uh, an original member of uh, of that, too. I'm on Smoking, and they call me Mr. Earl, his uh, two very first recordings. Yeah, you have played with a ton of very, very famous uh, blues cats. Uh, you are one of the many who never uh, or, or took years to get out of out of, uh, out of college. There, my son actually graduated from there, and every year we would fight yeah. him to uh, <laughs> to stay and not hit the road. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Well, after I graduated from from uh, Berkeley, around two thousand or so, two thousand two, somewhere around there. Um, I actually went on and got my master's degree at, uh, from Skidmore College in, in music also. That's great. So you have played with a bunch of guys. Uh, you played with Muddy Waters and B.B. Uh, King, Otis Rush, Chuck mm-hmm. Berry. I mean, God, everybody knows these names. Uh, yeah, I like Mama to say Taylor. I have my master's degree in music, but my uh, Ph.D. in bluesology from playing with uh, all those cats. You know, um, you know, I'm... I feel very fortunate coming up at the time that I did, and that, you know, a lot of the younger guys now will never have that experience. You know, I was on the road with Otis Rush for a long time. Jimmy Rogers was my roommate. I did two records with uh, Big Walter Horton. Uh, I, I spent six months with J.B. Hutto. You know, I got to play with all these all these great uh, people from, uh, especially from the Chicago area, because you know we were kind of known as you know Chicago kind of blues band, even though we're you know we're located in the in the Boston area. And we also also bring out a lot of piano players like Sonny Land Slim, <clears throat> excuse me, um, Memphis Memphis Slim. And so I, I, you know, I watched those guys like hawks. You know, I, you know, even when I wasn't uh, playing with the band, the band would be playing, and they would be, uh, you know, backing up someone like Memphis Slim or, or Sonny Land Slim. I'd be like, you know, peeking through the curtains to see how, you know, what their fingers were doing and things like that. And uh, later on in his life, Pine Top Perkins became a very good friend of mine. Uh, and he used to stay at my house, and he used to play piano. And my son, who was like you know three or four at the time, would um, 
you know, pretend he was playing harmonica and, you know, Pine Top and my son would uh, sing train songs together. And it oh, was man. Great. I hope, I, I really I hope you recorded some of those. There. <laughs> did, did you record them? No, I, I, uh, as I just said, I wish we had iPhones back then. You know, oh, no one man. had anything to record it with. But it was, uh, it was precious moments that I'll, uh, I'll never forget, you know. Wow. Well, you know, it's it's a funny thing because, man, you are a great blues player. Um, Thank I've you. I've had the opportunity to listen to uh, a, a lot of what you do. And I at the same time, when, when you talk about blues players... Most people get the image that blues players are kind of, you know, the uneducated guys out there who, uh, you know, who just, just, uh, music is their only thing and that's the only thing they know. And yet I talk to a bunch of people who will tell me that they have, you know, uh, 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 an, an advanced degree. Mm-hmm. And which you have as well. So it's not blues is not just for the you know, the guy that uh, is not educated. It's it's really for anybody. Well, I think you have to differentiate between uh, maybe what you're calling educated and being wise. <laughs> like when I used to play with Muddy Waters, um, uh, you know, I just sat in with Muddy about a half dozen times. I was never actually in Muddy Waters' band. Mm-hmm. And but uh, between like Muddy Waters and you know JB Hutter, who I did spend about. Uh, six months uh, on the road with, um, they really didn't read or write very well. And um, so, like, every day, um, at least once a day, when we're on the road with J.B. Hutto, we had to go to uh, um, a restaurant called Denny's. I think they're, I think they're nationwide uh, chain. Right. And we couldn't, we couldn't figure it out why, why he wanted to go to Denny's every day. You know, I mean, food's okay. It's not great. No, yeah. uh, but we, we finally figured out, like, after a couple of days, that Denny's had a picture menu. So if he wanted, you know, oh, wow. breakfast, if he wanted ham and eggs, he'd point to that. If it was, you know, dinner and he wanted a, you know, fried chicken or whatever, you know, he would point to that. So those guys grew up very different. They weren't highly educated, but they were very wise. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I definitely understand. And you can hear that through the, the beauty uh, of their music. Uh, absolutely. You know, you know, you think about blues, you know, you know, it's basically three chords but it's what it's what you do with those three chords the, the soulfulness that you put into those three chords that means everything i mean you think about the three chords the quote unquote the uh, classic blues progression it's very different you know when i played with otis rush as as and and the very different when i played with uh you know, i was chuck berry's piano player when he came out east so there's two examples of like you know basically the same three chords same keys but you have to approach it differently and kind of know the different styles that are within the blues and how subtle they really, really are. How to how to not get in someone's way, either get in the vocalist's way or the guitar player's uh, way or a horn player's way. How to be in the back background, and I think that's what a lot of people are lacking these days. They don't know how to support each other. You know, I mean, there's a lot of um, bands out there that you know, kind of everybody's just going for it all the time you know i love the subtlety in music that to me means uh a lot i think ronnie earl once told told me one time you know sometimes you know the space between notes is equal much better than the notes that you're playing oh, you know man. I, you, you know, know I, I, I do master classes on guitar anthony and i always tell people i always ask younger people what do you think the most important part of music is and you know they They'll go crazy with different answers, and I say, "Well, sure. I believe it's silence. Mm-hmm. I think silence is the most poignant part of music because without it, it's like exhaling all the time and never inhaling." Right, and uh, you know, I, and that's why you know your ears, you know, is, is is the biggest thing you have going going for us. No matter what style of music you play, I don't care if you're playing country, western, jazz, pop music, blues, you got to listen to what's going on around you. You know. You know, you don't need to be a showboat to get your point across. You know, I, as I said before, I really believe in uh, in subtlety. You know, once you turn your once you turn the solo, okay, man, go crazy. You know, but if uh, if you're backing someone up, you know, especially me as a piano player, I feel like I'm almost like a an orchestrator behind someone. You know, I'm like the orchestra without an orchestra because I'm able to play, you know, five, six, seven notes at a time and give it that almost like big ensemble feeling. You know, and that's how I try to. Um, um, portray my my playing when I'm when I'm backing someone else up, whether it be like Ronnie Earl. Uh, I just um, 
did a recording session with Ronnie Earl two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Ronnie's got a new record coming out sometime this year, and I played a couple of songs uh, on that. And when, even when I'm writing my own songs, you know, um, uh, for my new record, um, Why Did You Have to Go? Um, you know, a lot of people will put out their own records, solo records, whatever you want to call it. They have to be like the featured person or featured uh, musician on every cut. I, I still, I still see myself as part of an ensemble, even if I'm the songwriter and I'm the quote unquote main artist of, uh, of the recording. And that to me means, means a lot. And it, a lot of people have mentioned that, uh, while reviewing the record, uh, how much space I give to, uh, everybody else. But I, but I treat it like, a, like I would my own band, you know, I don't have to solo every song, you know? Yeah, uh, well, you know, that's because you're not a guitar player. Probably. <laughs> 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 uh, I'm, I'm only kidding. It's a typical guitar player joke. I mean, God, guitar player. Yeah, and, you know, I um, I, I just uh, did the judging for the IBC in Memphis. Oh, great. <laughs> yeah, I guess. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a unique situation because... Most of the time, I leave shaking my head, thinking, "Why did that sound more like a competition than than a band?" <laughs> uh, I I agree with you totally. A, a lot of what I hear out there are are good players, but they they don't seem to be listening to each other. Right. And I I boy I cannot I can't handle that because it's not about how fast you play. The song is the god. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think that's what it is, too. Um, as I said, you know, earlier on in our conversation that, you know, I, I was able to play play with the people that a lot of the people that, you know, originated, you know, the Chicago, you know, blue style, everyone, you know, from, you know, Otis Rush to like many, many, many other people, Jimmy Rogers, who you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And um, but before I even do before I even, you know, knew them, you know, you consider these people like, you know, gods and stuff. I remember when I first started listening to blues. Uh, when I was about 15 or 16 years old, and you know, I heard Chicago Bound by uh, Sh uh, by Jimmy Rogers, it like kind of freaked me out. I said, "Man, that, that that's like you know, really, really good music." I, I said, "Well, you know, I want I want to do that in my life. You know, never in my wildest dreams would I, you know, five or six years later, you know, you know, see myself as being Jimmy Rogers' roommate on the road, and he's telling me, you know." Uh, you know, Otis Spann stories and things like that. It was, you know, pretty heavy. Or, you know, have, you know, B.B. King invite me on stage uh, many times, you know. Uh, I never would have thought that in a million years when I first started listening to this music. Yeah, you know, uh, it. I was so heartened when I, when I read that, you know, you were, as you were younger, you were one of your, one of your big uh, inspirations was Jimmy Rogers. And then all of a sudden, years later, you end up with Jimmy Rogers. I think that's amazing. Right. That, that's what I mean. I feel very blessed how my, uh, if you want to call it my musical career has, uh, has developed. Um, you know, when you hear, if you listen to that early record, uh, Chicago Bound by, uh, by Jimmy Rogers has, you know, the great Otis Spann on, on, on piano. It's like really perfect ensemble playing, which once again gets back to what I was talking about before. Everybody is like shining, but no one's getting in each other's way. Yeah. Yeah, no, I man, I agree. I, uh, I'm I'm noticing, uh, and this is a good thing. There are some modern modern blues people who are younger. Uh, mm -hmm. Clark is Clark Junior is is one that I'm starting to listen to a lot, and yeah. it's not about he's a great guitar player, but it's more about the song. As a matter of fact, he doesn't go around you know sixteen times, you know, like mm -hmm. like. Hey. Like, I think there was a period of that. He goes around once, maybe twice, and then back to the song. And even when he does that, it's not, it's not I'm at 11. It's, there's dynamics right. and uh, silence. And, uh, well, I believe, you know, I believe in songs, and I think, you know, people can, um, like, like my, my brand new record, Why Did You Have to Go, and my previous uh, recording, Fifty Shades of Blue, right. you know, I wrote all the songs on, on, both, on both those recordings. Um, but they're like, you know, three, four minute songs. There's like one song, I think, on each, each of those recordings that's six or seven minutes long. Um, so I, you know, I'm a firm believer in a song being a song, you know, you know, I mean, if you're going to make an instrumental record, that's fine, make an instrumental record. Um, but I believe in the, in, in the songs really speaking for themselves. I, you know, I like to consider myself a songwriter as much as a piano or organ player. 
And what you have to do in those two, three, or four minutes is hopefully, you know, people can, like, you know, shut their eyes and you can convey some kind of imagery uh, to them, you know. Like on my, um, my new record, uh, there's a song called Bapt- Baptized in the River Yazoo. It's just mm-hmm. me playing piano and uh, a gentleman named Willie J. Law singing. So it's, you know, really stripped down. But it's about, and I wrote it down while I was down in Clarksdale, Mississippi. And it, to me, you know, being down there, uh, down in Clarksdale and in that area, I mean, I go walking in, on, I, it sounds it sounds cliche, but I do. I go walking on the on the railroad tracks and things like that. And there's there's something that that's there. The, the smell of the uh, the dirt, the air, the you know, sometimes the wind. That's you know, you can the grit that's in the wind and stuff. You know. And I wrote about three or four of the songs on my new record while I was down in uh, Clarksdale, Mississippi. Wow, it makes me want to go down there, man. <laughs> it's awesome. Yeah. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about uh, equipment for the musicians out there. Um, yeah. What uh, What is your preference? Uh, a Steinway uh, Model B. <laughs> <laughs> That's cheap, I right? I'm sure you bring Model that on a, the road B, with you, right? I have a Steinway Model A and a B3 here at my house, but they don't leave the house. Um, you know, electric pianos have come a long, long way in the, the last 20 years or so, but I remember when we were on the road with the Blue Tones in the early days when Ronnie was still in the band, you know, we were carrying a spinet. We carry a spinet in the van and take it out, and I had a tuning hammer. I wasn't very good at tuning the piano, but I did my best every once in a while on the road. We'd try to get a piano tuner in there. Um, mm-hmm. But, um, you know, even the best uh, digital stage pianos, whatever you want to call them, still aren't the best to, to me and stuff. You know, I have a really high end one. I have a, a a high-end Kawhi that I uh, that I have right now, and it has a really really good piano sound. Is uh, Yamaha just came out with a I think a brand new CP3 or a CP4 that I haven't checked out, but I'm going to try to check it out in the next uh, next uh, month or so. I'm about due for a new piano uh, mm-hmm. um, because I, I kind of wear them out. I play a little hard. <laughs> <laughs> After a few years, they're ready to uh, they're ready to just to go back in my basement. My basement's got about it's like it's like the the elephant graveyard of pianos. You oh, know, I got geez. like four or five, six, seven pianos down in my basement oh, <laughs> collecting dust. Yeah, give dust. me your so, address. So, <laughs> yeah, so as good as and as long of a way as they come and as good as they are. Um, it's still not like playing a, an acoustic piano. And I do realize that we live in a world where, you know, it's a guitar dominated world. And Ugh. we're, even in my band with me being a leader as a piano player, I know that we play pretty loud, you know. Um, but we did a gig a few weeks ago. Um, actually a really nice little theater, uh, near where I live in, uh, in Plymouth, Mass called the Spire, Spire Theater for the Performing Arts. And they have like a concert, uh, Grand Yamaha. And I used that that night, and it was the band was like a totally different band, you know. I brought my I brought my Hammond organ with me, uh, and I used the acoustic piano, and we actually broke it down. We did a, a short set, uh, had everybody like uh, come around the piano. Uh, the guitar player Troy Gagne used like a resonator guitar, no mic and stuff, because it's you know it's a beautifully acoustic, uh, acoustically uh, ready room, mm-hmm. and, and it was just so much fun doing that. And it's hard to do something like that with an electric piano, kind of. Even if you do it, it, it kind of just doesn't feel the same. You are, you know, I I totally agree with you. By the way, and and musicians who are good and listeners, they 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 will come down to wherever the yeah. volume starts at. Uh, I've got a I've got a really loud drummer, really heavy. But when we use an acoustic piano rather than electric, I oh, notice, yeah. man, he's totally different. Yeah, I, I know it's a lot of, when I play in Europe a lot, a lot of the, they call them jazz clubs, but they're multifunctional, they have blues, jazz, and, you know, other kinds of music. Um, a lot of them do still have pianos, and it's very rare, very rare that, that clubs these days in the United States uh, ha- have them, unless they're like a real high-end jazz room, you know? Right. Uh, but 99% of the clubs uh, anymore don't, don't, have, uh, don't have an acoustic piano, you know? And that's kind of unfortunate, you know. When I used to talk to uh, talk to Sonny Land Slim about that one time. You know, he goes, you know, I go to these places. You know, this is kind of pre pre digital piano, obviously. You know, he said he used to go in places. Sometimes he goes, only half the keys would work, but you got to you got to make it work. You know what I mean? I mean, I did one gig we a long time ago. We were in uh, New Hampshire with Sugar Ray and the Blue Toads, and they had a, it was a decent 
small baby grand, not, nothing, uh, nothing fancy or anything, but it was, it was good. It sounded good, you know. So we played that gig, and I played it on acoustic piano through like an SM57, you know, on the soundboard, and you know, like, that was got to be as loud as I needed to be to play with the band. And we went back a couple of months later, and I said, "Oh, good, I get to play that nice baby grand again." And I left my, uh, I don't even know what I was using for a piano at that time. We went back to the club. They gutted the piano and turned it into a salad bar. Oh. <laughs> so, so I didn't get to play that night. <laughs> so I think that's, you know, what happened to most of the pianos. They turned into salad bars or something. Oh, man. That is, that's a great story, man. <laughs> but I actually made a pretty good salad bar because, you know, the way the contour of a grand piano and stuff, you know. Oh, and the chickpeas were, re were really good that night. I'm not sure. <laughs> so you did a vegetarian gig, man. <laughs> wow, that's funny. So I, I I would love to hear if you if you've got one you can share. Uh since you've been with so many icons, can you give me a story that maybe they told you uh about you know, life on the road or something that maybe nobody knows about? Oh, well, I got a kind of a good big Joe Turner story. I, I was Joe Turner's uh, piano player for a while when he used to come out. Uh, he used to great blue shouter from uh, Kansas City, and uh, he was great. So I, you know, I, we picked him up at the airport and we dropped him off at the hotel. And I, I said, Joe, I'll be uh, I'll be back around six o'clock. I'll take you out to dinner before we do the gig. He goes, okay. And then he goes, okay, son. And I swear to God, Joe Turner, the way he talked was exactly the way he sang. Mm. It was, it was like beautiful. Um, so I picked him up about six o'clock and you know, I was like probably my early twenties and he goes, uh, can you stop at, stop at the package store and get a six pack and some VO or something like that? I said, yeah, sure. You know, so I went and got him a six pack. So I, I had the band van. I owned it at the time. So he's sitting in the uh, passenger seat and, you know, I give him the six pack of beer and, um, so he opens a beer. You know, at that time, people were, like, drinking in cars. Yeah, right. So uh, you had your drinking he opens, whiskey with He you. opens a can of beer. It takes him, like, three seconds to, uh, to, 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 to down it, rolls the window down, you know, and throws the can out the window. <laughs> so I said, hey, Joe, you can't do that. I backed up the van and made him get out and get it. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. You know, so you know, just just things like that. You know, you know, I hung out with Big. Uh, I did a show with Big Mama Thornton one time, and uh, uh, up up in I think it was a little blues festival a long, long time ago in New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. So we did the first number. We bring you know, we're all like you know, oh, okay, we're you know, backing up Big Mama Thornton, and uh, so um, she sings her first number, and she goes. I want this whole band off the stage except for that piano picker. I'm thinking to myself, oh, my God, here, what have I got myself into? Jeez. So she goes behind the drums. She, you know, there's no, just me and her on stage now. She goes behind the drums. She's playing drums. She's singing. She has one harmonica. And I don't remember if it was a B or an F sharp, but it was like the, you know, absolute worst keys for, you know, piano players sure. to play, especially when you're kind of first still, you know, first learning, you know, how to play blues and stuff like that. And I had to do the whole set, I think, in like an F sharp or something, oh. you know. But you know what? Uh. You know what? You get put to the fire, you gotta you gotta do it and stuff, you know, the show goes on, you know. I bet you're and good I, at F sharp now, man. She, 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 <laughs> she, she didn't kick me out, so I guess that was good. That's amazing. Yeah, what you I don't know why you didn't use a capo. <laughs> yeah. and then, you know, I, I, I got a funny story about uh, uh, piano. Uh, I guess you can do uh, change keys on that, but I'm not going to tell you that one right now. <laughs> <laughs> actually, it another actually, I've really experienced <laughs> that with a really good keyboard player who forgot that he had changed his uh, <laughs> tuning. Yeah. You know, and now you can do it with a switch, man, but... Uh, F sharp, that's that's a tough one. So uh, you've got really great albums out, and I've I've listened to uh, a bunch of all of them. Um, Why did you have to go? Is the newest one Fifty well, Shades? So yep, that's on uh, that's on Shining Stone Records, and I'm and I'm thrilled that it was you know nominated in six categories. You know, from the uh, the Blues Music Awards, uh, you know, the Blues uh, Foundation, you know, it was um, nominated for Album of the Year. Traditional album of the year, uh, song of the year from one of the songs I wrote, Angelina Angelina, that features uh, Sugar Ray Rayford on vocals, mm -hmm. uh, Monster Mike Welch on guitar. Um, I was really shocked that I got um, nominated for traditional blues male artist. Um, I'm also nominated for the Pine Top Perkins Piano Award. I it's saw that. Fourth, yeah. four, uh, fourth year in a row for that. And my band, Anthony Jirasi and the Boston Blues All Stars, was nominated for Band of the Year. 
Yeah, you you got and man, I, I will tell anybody who hasn't listened to your stuff, what you had said earlier is true. Uh, I give you an example, Sh- Sugar Ray, who uh, I've actually interviewed uh, on the <clears throat> show. He's got an amazing voice, and it's so soulful. You got him on there. You got a bunch yeah. of really good musicians. So it's not it's not like a lot of blues albums. It's not a one trick pony deal where it's right. the same voice. It's the same, you know. Here's the keyboard player, and he's really great, which you are. But it's not just you know. It's not keyboard centric. It's uh, it's band centric, I guess. Yeah. Well, I'm thrilled that all these people, you know, are on my record. You know, I got, you know, for guitar players, I got Kid Ramos, Ronnie Earl, Monster Mike Welch, and uh, the guitar player of my band also, um, Troy Gagne. Um, you know, for vocalists, I got, the, you know, Mr. Rayford, I got Sugar Ray Norcia, Michelle Wilson, and Dennis Brennan, who is the singer in, 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 my, in, my, in my touring band. You know, I got Mudcat Ward and uh, Willie J. Campbell on bass, you know, Jimmy Bott on drums, you know, it's they're pretty good but it's not like I was like looking oh let me see who I can get the best people to play on these songs these people are all like my dear friends you mm-hmm. know yeah. and uh, when I when I write songs I kind of have people in mind um, I'm actually starting to sing more so I might sing one or two songs on my next record that I'll probably start in the, in the fall yeah. but I do have you know when I'm when I'm writing songs I can like envision let's say the song that um, Sugar Ray Rayford uh, sings that got nominated for a song of the year Angelina Angelina when I wrote that I immediately had him in mind for singing it, you know, and I was able to, you know, see it, see it through to have him be on that recording. Yeah, that's that's what I that's what I was struck with when I listened to it. I said, "Man, this is this is a wonderful album of you know, you know, to go back on your piano that that turned out to be a salad bar. This is uh <laughs> this is like you get to pick uh the pick the the fruit that you, the vegetables that you like the best on this one. Mm-hmm. Uh, really yeah. great stuff. It it and uh, it's recorded well, by the way. Um, yeah, thank you. I did uh, I did half of it, believe it or not, in Missouri when we were doing uh, some gigs out there with uh, the guys that eventually became the Proven Ones, who I'm also playing with. The guys mm-hmm. from the West Coast, uh, uh, Willie J. Campbell, Jimmy Bott, and um, and Kid Ramos. Where he, that's a, that's another project that I'm, I'm involved with. And uh, Brian Templeton is a, is a singer with that, and then the rest of it I did, of course, uh, here in my uh, my native Boston. Well, that's great. So tell people, Anthony, how they can hear your new music and your um, and your mm-hmm. other albums. Sure. Um, well, you can go to my to my website, uh, anthonygerasiblue dot com. A n t h o n y g e r a c i b l u e Dot com that has really all my gigs on it how to uh if you wish to purchase any of my recordings uh it's on that um or they can go to uh shining stone which is my uh my record label shining stone blue duchess records i think it's uh blue duchess uh dot com um and you can get records from there but it's on you know itunes amazon.com and if you just punch up my name you'll probably see a, you know like four or five of my uh my recordings on that all right, and you have on your website you have a bunch of tour dates coming up. Yeah, I do. Let me see where I'm going. Uh, I got some uh, shows coming up uh, on my own uh, with my band Anthony Jirasi and the Boston Blues All Stars. Um, like some here in the states, some some in uh, some in Europe. I have some dates coming up with the Proven Ones also in uh, in Europe. Uh, I'm doing some things in. Um, uh, in Canada on my own. Uh, so there's a lot. There's a lot. I'm playing at the Ottawa Blues Fest. I'm like the uh, um, headlining the, uh, they have a jam every night. Uh, they call it a pro jam. Mm-hmm. And I'm doing that for like three nights in a row. Then the Proven Ones are going to meet me up there. We're going to do a, a show uh, on, on on our own. I'm very proud that um, I'm bringing my band to the No uh Blues Festival in Norway. Uh, wow. Uh, that that's in uh, that'll be in August, so I'm really happy about that. And I just um, signed with uh, Intrepid Artists out of uh, North Carolina. And they, you right. know, they handle you know people, uh, everybody from like Papa Chubby, Walter Walter Trout, uh, Eric Gales. Um, so I'm really proud to be associated with them. And uh, I just signed with them, you know, within the last month. And they're already, you know, things are already starting to come in. And um, once again, I'm really happy to be uh, associated with them. That's excellent. Yeah, that's a, a certainly a well-known and respected yeah. agency. That's great. Absolutely. 
yeah. Uh, Papa and Chubby all, is out here. You you probably know that he's. Yeah, I know. I, I know. I know Papa Chubby well. Yeah. And uh, you know, I also I also teach at the uh, Pine Top Perkins uh, uh, Foundation, the Pine Top Perkins Workshop that's in Clarksdale, Mississippi. This will be my third year uh, teaching there. That's in June, and it's really good. It brings young young people, literally from all around the world, most mostly from the United States. But last year we had about three or four people from uh, uh, from Europe come. Excuse me, and it's it's a great week of you know them learning from people like myself, Bob Mark Bowens down there, um, Heather Cross, who's a great bass player, lives in, around uh, Clarksdale, um, uh, Phil Wiggins, uh, Monica. I mean, really good people are, are teaching these uh, these youngsters, and they're very very passionate about the blues. Matter of fact, if any of your uh, listeners uh, watched The Voice last year. Sarah Grace, who went pretty far in the competition there, was one of my students uh, two years ago there. Oh, that's great, man. Yeah. Wow. Well, everybody, we are, we're very excited. I think this was a, a great time, and if you uh, are a musician, you're going to learn a lot about uh, listening and the uh, biggest part of music out there. Uh, mm-hmm. Anthony Girassi, thank you so much for uh, being with us on uh, ChasingTheBluesPodcast.com. It's been awesome. Thank you very much. I hope to be uh, talking with you again sometime. You will and be. If, yeah. you, uh, well, if uh, you or any of your uh, um, people listening to uh, to this uh, come to any of my shows, please come say hi. I enjoy meeting people. Absolutely. Uh, uh, make sure you do that. This is He does great shows, and you've got some great people in your band. Yeah, and I'd just like to say one thing. I know you know people say it a lot, but we really have to go support our local musicians and you know musicians that are touring through uh, our you know our town or city wherever we live. Because you know, if people don't show up, there's you know it's going to be less and less bands. I know even here in the Boston area, over the last couple of years, a, a few venues have closed, and it's you know it's kind of sad. It's a little bit harder and harder to uh, make things happen on, on a local scene. Uh, so really, you know, if you can, you know, go support your local musicians. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, especially those original musicians who really actually have the harder road. <laughs> mm-hmm. I know that. Thank you, Anthony. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Take I appreciate care. you very much. All right. Chasing the Blues is recorded at Factory Underground Studios in Norwalk, Connecticut. You can learn more about Factory Underground at factoryundergroundstudio.com. And connect with me on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, at Tom the Suit Forced. You can find my music, tour dates, merch, and more on TomTheSuitForced.com. Thank you for listening. Trying to find some destination. And on my trails, a winding road. When I heard a distant strumming. That my imagination Then I saw a man In a black robe He was a man Of the mountain Straggly hair And dirty beard Knowing look In his one eye He said Boy you sure look lost Why not sit a spell with me and he told me all about my life He said You're going home Going home Someday You're going back Where we come from You're going home Going home Same way You're going home When your time comes Seems out of view.
Going home, going home, someday we're going back where. 